And I say that a pure tone means nothing unless it is stabbed into life, into blood, into an ambience. Otherwise, it's a mere toy which has no call on being appreciated. Leos Janáček was born deep in the mid-19th century. His music belongs wholly to the avant-garde of 20th century music. Although he was 30 years older than Bartók and Stravinsky, and 40 years older than Onega and his associates of the Paris Six, Janáček's works rank among the most progressive in modern European music. A penurious Moravian village boy, his beginnings were hard indeed. When he studied organ playing in Prague, he seemed to be living on sheer enthusiasm. He couldn't afford even to hire a harmonium, let alone a piano. It was painful. I had always thirsted for a living tone. Ever a straightforward man, the young Janáček slated the conducting of the organ school director Skuherski, who made sure that Janáček left the school, if only for a time. A memorable day for me. I had to suffer for speaking the truth. Throughout his life, he would be obsessed by the search for the truth of musical expression. Who would believe that this prim, pensnazed student was to become a great non-conformist rebel. Here we are struck by a paradox typical of Janáček. This was the sort of sleek, brilliantined music he wrote in those days. Piano variations dedicated to Zdenka, who was later to become his wife. It was because of his traditionalist views that he left the Vienna Conservatory. For a time, he stopped composing altogether, seeking his own personal idiom. And returning to his childhood, his native Lashsko region, he studied the local speech and collected folk songs and dances. Surprisingly, those studies led him into a new and different sphere of music. Folk songs. That is what I have lived in since my childhood. The folk song is the whole man, body and soul, the environment, everything, everything. In that way, I purify my musical thinking. He started adapting folk songs wrote the Lashsko dances and composed the first tones of Yanufa. When the critics attacked Yanachik, saying that he put the folk tunes he had learned into Yanufa, the composer denied the charge. There's not a single foreign or folk tone in Yanufa. In studying folk songs and speech, Janáček came upon his greatest 
and most original discovery. Yendo! 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 The song melody is only the mirror of a soul fired by music, whereas speech melodies are the reflections of all life. Destebi! Ukolosha! Sudam ribi! Pekne! Cherspe! He jotted down speech melodies and rhythms, thus providing an ordeal psychological portrait of each speaker. Please don't drive me out. It is cold outside. That poor man's exclamation resulted in a small musical gem. Indolent critics alleged that Janáček's operas were jigsaw puzzles, put together from scraps of speech melodies. The originals of the motifs make a deep imprint in my soul, but I never put them into my compositions. The motifs of each word of Genufa are close to life. Even be spoken. Is it conceivable, though, that I should stealthily take the collected speech melodies, those snippets of strangers' souls, sensitive to the point of pain, and use them in putting together my work? Who can put about such nonsense? Janáček had recourse to speech melodies at one of the hardest moments of his life. I don't want to die. I want to live. The fear. I'm going to die. 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 He wrote down the last words of Olga, his dying daughter, as if wanting death to reveal his secrets. I should bind Genufa with a black ribbon of the long illness, pain and lament of my daughter Olga and my little boy Vladimir. Oh, <laughs> 
The notes of Yanufa, too, seemed to reflect a tragic struggle. Somebody scoffed that Yanufa wailed as if her canary had died. But Yanachik saw both his children die, Vladimir and the daughter Olga. And he knew that true sorrow is never bombastic. The unfortunate Yanachik suffered another blow. The National Theatre rejected Yanufa. I charge that it was injustice to reject Yanufa. I complain as a Czech composer who has been refused a hearing. The National Theatre stuck to its decision. Janáček was in despair. He destroyed some of his works. I am no good. I am no good. It took all of 13 years for the National Theatre to mount a production of Yanufa. What strength Janáček must have had to overcome the desperation of that endless wait. Downcast outcast, like moldy bread. Despondent music, like the composition in Mists. That was what he wrote at that time. He celebrated his 60th birthday as an obscure composer and a cranky Moravian separatist. But the long-awaited day was to come very soon. Yeah, 
The famous first night of Yanufa at the National Theatre in Prague was also an eloquent demonstration against Austria. Janáček had always been powerfully attracted by the idea of pan-Slavism. While the First World War was still raging, he wrote his great Taras Bulba. Ah. Wait for the downbeat. You are too impatient. Mind those ligatures. Wait for me. Right, now it wasn't so bad. Not because he slew his own son for having betrayed his people, not because of the martyrdom of his other son, but because the fires, the torture are not in the world that would destroy the strength of the Russian people. In independent Czechoslovakia, Janáček proudly espoused the national cause. His Sinfonietta was dedicated to the city of Brno. When Janáček went to England in 1925, he said, In London, in Venice, in Vienna, in Prague, and in all those Moravian villages, 
wherever I went, I've always realized the true power of music. It resounds everywhere, and it joins us, people. It makes us strong and able to counter the evil that exists in the world. quiet little house in Bonaire. The music that was composed here was soon heard all over the world. These unique authentic shots were made at the time of Janáček's growing fame, a congress of European composers in Prague in 1925, a river outing. The lady with a hat is Maria Kalmer, who helped to promote Yanufa. The incredible fecundity of Janáček's late years had its secret. Janáček loved going to the spa of Luhačevice. It was there, in 1917, one year after the success of Janufa, that he met Kamila Šteslova. Janáček often got carried away by the image of a woman. He found inspiration in women. The worst thing is to try to trammel emotion. Let us set out in search of Janáček's desire for emotion, for love. Let us return to his childhood. He was born at Hukvalde in 1854, the son of a village schoolmaster, his tenth and certainly not the last child. At the age of 11, he was sent to Beno as a choir boy to learn singing at a monastery. Strangers, Unfriendly people, the school strange, the bed hard, the bread even harder. Deserted and guarded, we spend sad moments gazing out of the barred windows. Couldn't Janáček's obsession with love perhaps be traced back to the loneliness and emotional deprivation of his childhood? He needed love unconditionally and he embodied his need in the picture of a woman. Never mind that reality rarely corresponded with his dreams. It didn't in the case of his wife, Stenka. It didn't in the case of the flirtatious Kamila Urvarkova, or Kamila Šteslava, who for the last 11 years of Janáček's life symbolized for him beauty and love. She was the miraculous source of youthful inspiration, and yet she had no understanding for music at all. She used to say, Those notes of yours. But she was indomitably joyful and vivacious, and Janáček projected into her his ideal picture of a woman, something he couldn't live without. There's a world of sheer beauty between us. But the beauty in it, all, all the beauty, is but imagined. I need this imaged world in my life as much as I need air and water. If we compare the letters, up to eight a day, he wrote to his beloved Zdenci before she was 15, with the letters he wrote to Camilla 
almost half a century later, we find an incredible similarity between them. Whenever he wrote, he wrote to his only imagined woman, his emotional alter ego. Is it not true, my dearest Denshi, that only love that ennobles is true love? My dear Camilla, our friendship is, as you know, deep. I need it for being able to live contentedly, to live happily. Love me a lot, my dearest Denshi, because your love keeps me up. It is only you I believe in. I am a child by nature. And only you keep the child up. Only your soul. Zdenchi, you are my only source of strength. Should the thread that joins me to you, my dearest Camilla, be severed, the thread of my life would be severed. The object of his desire was far less important for Janáček than desire itself. He jealously guarded the inviolability of his idea against the others and against himself. Luckily, only I am a flame. I like talking to you too, because I know that ours is a pure friendship. You write about my beauty, but there you are making a mistake. I love my husband so much that I would be willing to put my head on the block for him. I long for him as much as you do for me. It's better that you're so old. If you were younger, my husband would never allow this. I'm glad to be able to live in you. What about other people? Her eyes nearly pop out of their heads. I have success, a passion in my works. Where has the man got it from? A mystery. I would love to shout, to raise you up. Look, the dear, the dearest mystery of my life. The picture of Camilla can be found in Katya Kabanova, in Aleya and Akulka, in his opera From the House of the Dead, in The Gypsy Girl from The Diary of One Who Vanished. You are my Zefka. Janáček wrote to Camilla. I want you to know that the musician in me is much more than mere man. The universal human emotion that fills the heart and all the time of the other fellow is suppressed in me just as violently as it was kindled in me. Another work directly inspired by Camilla was the opera Katya Kabanova. My Katya grows in her in her, in Mrs. Camilla. The work will be one of my most tender. 
The Macropolis Case is another opera connected with Camilla by a reproachful letter from Janáček. Well, come and have a look at that cold lady. You are going to see a portrait of yourself. Slyšíte, Emilie? There was another paradoxical element in Janáček's relationship with Camilla. For the composer, 38 years her senior, Camilla's world was a picture of familial happiness, something he himself had lost by the death of his children. Camilla's children, Rudy and Otto, attracted him to her too. Let us hear Camilla's son, Otto Stössel, almost 70 years later. I haven't been here for almost 60 years. My mother and I spent two weeks here and nothing has changed since. The pictures Janáček bought from my father and his study, I can recognize it all after all those years. And the harmonium too. It was because of that instrument my mother wanted to leave after a few days. Janáček started playing at 2 a.m. Not songs we would understand, uh, but strange chords. In the end, things were settled. He didn't play so much at night. 
and we stayed for the two weeks until his death. Twelve-year-old Otto probably also heard these tones of the harmonium. The composition, I am waiting for you, inscribed in Camilla's album. They were Janáček's very last notes. He wanted me to be a child prodigy. My brother played the violin, so my parents bought a piano, but I was hopeless, couldn't play a thing. My mother was greatly flattered when the famous man came to Pisek to visit us. Mother had no ear for music. She got letters every day. Wherever he went, he wrote to her. A letter from England was all in notes. It's a pity that it is lost. The most beautiful of the letters Janáček ever wrote to Camilla was his second string quartet, Intimate Letters. started writing something nice. Our lives will be in it. It'll be called Love Letters. The whole piece will be held together by a strange instrument. It's called Viola d'Amore, the viola of love. Janáček and the famous incident with the viola d'amore, as recalled by František Kudláček, the then leader of the Moravian Quartet. One evening, Janáček said, I have written my second quartet, but he said nothing about the instrument. Later, before we started rehearsing, he said that the quartet was for the viola d'amore. All the stuff that's played by the viola was to have been done by the damore. Lots of the highly technical stuff he always used. Now, I saw there would be trouble, so I told him straight away. And he said, it's an instrument, isn't it? Why couldn't it be played? I said, all right, I'll play it for you. So I did. And all the time I thought, my God, this instrument to be coupled with a cello and two violins? How could I play this? I asked. He stuck to his guns, but we never even started rehearsing with the Damore. Viola it was in the end. You know, an emotion can be so powerful that the notes hide and run away from it. Great love and her puny composition. What would I like? Great love and a famous composition. With me, it is great love and steady. 
a wide field with the sun above, as if day and night. This passionately youthful music was composed by a man of 74, but Janáček didn't live to hear the premiere of his intimate letters. The last stairs of Janáček's last outing with my mother and me. He was then three years older than I am now, and he wanted to show my mother a statue of himself that was put up in his lifetime. It's very steep up here. I think that was why he got pneumonia. I can deny the rumor that I got lost here. It is impossible to go astray in these parts, so the newspapers were wrong. Whatever the cause of Janáček's death, the clock of his life seemed to be going backwards. He created his most youthful works in old age. When somebody wrote that the glagolitic mass was the work of an old man and a believer, he retorted, No old man, no believer. Life, above all, eternal youth. Life is young. I love life. Yeah. 